становится. Good evening, everybody. Wow. Our quorum is here so we can call this meeting to order. Uh, put all rise. Oh, a roll call, I'm sorry. Thank you. Vice Mayor Smaglia. Present. Mayor Campbell. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Vignola. Here. Commissioner Carter. Present. City Manager Goodrum. Here. City Attorney Hearn. Here. We'll stand for the pledge. Chief, would you lead us in the pledge? Please join us in a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Do we have any public comment at this time? Anybody in the public want to speak? There are no signed speakers. Vice Unsigned, Mayor. okay. All right, thank you. I guess we are, uh, Catherine, you going to uh, take it from here for a while? Okay. <clears throat> thank you, Vice Mayor, and thank you, Commission. Uh, the foundation for tonight's presentation was built from the previous workshops um, on the strategic planning process the, for the business plan, which we discussed at the end of June. And we're here to ensure that we are on our way to the budget hearings um, in September for September 12th and 20th. City of Coral Springs budget overview is um, as, as follows, it's 215.5 million. We have 10 funds, 859 full um, FTEs. And you will also note that the CRA expenditures are included in the general fund. So today we will give an update on the hurricanes, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Matthew, Hurricane Wilma, and Eric Van Mason from Stantec. Uh, we'll run through the interactive financial forecasting model uh, that will share the budget highlights and we'll state the business plan initiatives and conclude with the business plan two presentation of the resident and business impacts. There are three previous hurricanes in the city um, that we are still, or there were uh, three previous hurricanes the city is still dealing with um, financially and legally. We are addressing them, so just wanted to give you an update. The first of which is Hurricane Wilma. There's an appeal pending um, for the dispute amount of $205,170, and that is still ongoing. We do feel good about this in the respect that we can still receive money um, as we have from Hurricane Matthew. The cost of Hurricane Matthew um, from October of 2017 was uh, $304,054.58. We have received back $267,091.13. Um, again, we feel that uh, when we receive this money, the money from Hurricane Irma will flow through and this will conclude the updates as we have received the money back that we expected from the state um, from their reimbursement. Any questions on Hurricane Matthew? Okay. Um, this leaves us with Hurricane Irma. The cost of Hurricane Irma was $9.86 million. FEMA, we are expecting them to reimburse us for $9.5 million. Uh, we have had one PW that has already been obligated. Our emergency manager, Alex Falcone, has uh, worked very diligently with um, his friends, some of which are FEMA representatives who are re reviewing our PWs first. And I do think that we are kind of getting moved through the system and being told what to watch out for. And uh, we do feel good about that. So at this point, where does it leave us financially? Um, Hurricane Irma again cost about 9.8 million. Uh, we have paid out 3 million from 2017. And at this point, when we look at our latest CAFR and the stabilization fund from 2017, we have 21.2 million. In our unassigned reserves, we have 1.9 million. 
we will this year transfer um, 2.4 million into that reserve account. We knew that we, um, that was gonna be needed when we increased millage. So we've designated that money to go there. At that point, we'll have a total of unassigned of 4.4 million. We'll have to utilize that money to go toward the cost of the hurricane. So again, the, at this point, the remaining cost for Hurricane Irma is 6.8 million. We'll utilize that 4.4. We'll have to dip into our stabilization fund by 3 million. At this point, just wanted to let you know in the meantime that we have signed the open uh, line of credit for 10 million to make sure the city is well equipped to handle um, a hurricane of like size for um, 18 months um, as we are expected the reimbursement to, to follow during that time. At this point, we know that um, in our budget documents and in our CAFR that we will be documenting that we will have um, $3.3 uh, $3 million um, below what our stabilization fund will require us to have, but we do feel good about that coming in in 2019. At this point, I am going to hand it over to Stantec so that they can go through their interactive financial modeling, then I'll come back up after. Thank you, Catherine. Good evening, members of the commission and members of the public. My name is Eric Van Malsen. I'm a consulting manager with Stantec. The city has retained us to diagnostic and projected financial model of the city's general fund. Uh, please keep in mind that this is the general fund only. It does not contain any of the special revenue funds or enterprise funds. What it is is a 10-year cash flow model which simulates all of the cash coming in and out of the fund and how that relates to your reserve balances over time. Our goal for sustainability of a general fund would be to maintain reserve balances at or above your minimum target of 17% over the projection period while funding your ongoing operations with recurring revenues. What we're going to do is walk you through the same presentation we've given you before, but for the benefit of the public, we'll, we'll do it slowly and, and, and show you where we came from, where we are, and where we're going with the general fund. We're first going to look at it at a five-year period and then open it up to a 10-year period to show that the path that you're on is a sustainable one. There are some choices to be made, but however, we feel confident that the city can go in the right direction with the general fund with some of the easy decisions or not so easy decisions that the commission has to make and the city management has proposed. On the screen right now, it's a little hard to see, but the most important thing, Pete, if you can follow with your mouse, are the two top graphs. The right one represents line graphs of cash coming into the fund and cash coming out of the fund. To the extent that cash in exceeds cash out, the budget exists as a surplus and you add that surplus to your fund balance or the savings account, if you will, for the general fund. And that's graphically represented on the left. Those blue bars represent an active scenario of the cash flow status of the projected general fund. The green bars reflect a static scenario which we can change and save once we've made changes to the blue bars so you can see what the impacts of any changes to the model we made. And we're going to walk through some scenarios of not only what ifs, but what has happened leading up to now to show you what could be the sustainable future of this fund. Right now, if this model was current, correct, and projected as is as our baseline, you would see that it exists in a cash flow deficit situation where this fund is spending more than it's earning on an annual basis. And by the end of this fiscal year, you would have been out below your 17% reserve mark, followed by another year of cash flow deficits that would continue to deplete the fund. And by fiscal year 2020, the fund would be fully depleted of available reserves. But that's not the real situation. And we're gonna show you how you've gotten to a sustainable picture in just a minute. What this current picture represents is a time of last year before the council or commission, excuse me, decided to raise the millage rate to its current rate today. And what happened was a 1.075 increase to adjust the millage rate from 4.7982, Pete's going to calculate it, to 5.8732 of the current millage rate. And now you can see those blue bars show a more sustainable picture. But over the next three years, a cash flow deficit would show up that would only grow if no corrections were to take place. But that one millage adjustment provided a very needed sustainability factor for the next three years that if had not occurred, you would have been in a lot more dire situation than it is right now in terms of future sustainability. So I'm going to ask Pete to save this situation to last, and those green bars will now recalibrate, and you'll see what the next change was. 
As Catherine just went through, you do have some impacts on this fund from Hurricane Irma that need to be recognized. In fiscal year 18, there was $6.8 million out of the total that got pulled out in the fiscal year. The remaining of it came out in fiscal year 17. It's not shown in this model. It's accounted for in the fund balance, however, so we're not gonna accommodate that in this scenario. But once $6.8 million got taken out of the fund, we do expect that remaining full $9.5 million to be reimbursed in 2019. So Pete's gonna throw that in there and then calculate the model and show the impact of that. Pete, you're gonna have to reverse that. Yep. So it's a negative $6.8 million out of the fund, a positive 9.5 in, and that doesn't need to recur. So this is more of a situation as we come into fiscal year 18 where you can see that deficit below that black line, which is your 17% reserve mark, basically describes what Catherine just showed you as the use of fund balance and your CAFR will reflect that by the end of the fiscal year 18. However, in 2019, we expect to see some reimbursements which will counteract that in terms of your fund balance. Pete, if you could save this to last, this is now our baseline going into this budget year and some of the budget decisions that city management has proposed in this current budget. You can see starting in fiscal year 20, a cash flow deficit would start to recur and grow and use fund balances over time. And we've reviewed this not only with city management, but each of the commissioners one-on-one, -on -one, and we've talked about the potential options for offsetting this. One of the major changes in this current budget year was a recognition that the escalation rates on costs were far outpacing the escalation rates of potential revenues within the general fund. And one of the ways that could be corrected would be to adjust the salary escalation percentages for general employees and potentially for police as well. They're currently, as we started this analysis, at 4.75% annually for general employees and 5% for police. Based upon the city manager's recommendation, we're showing a budget now with a 3% escalator for both of those salaries. And as Pete changes those, we also know that that would save about $500,000 as baked into the budget numbers we have right now, and he's pulling that out. So if he calculates that, you'll see the impact of that change alone provided a dramatic shift upwards in terms of the slope, or downwards, I'm sorry, in the, terms of the slope of the costs uh, out of the fund. So that red bar over there is not so steep and it's not outpacing revenues as much as it was before we made that change. Pete, if you go ahead and save this to last to make the next change. The next major point of discussion we had in terms of managing the cost escalations came to healthcare costs. Um, changes have been made into the budget, which would save $410,000 annually from this budget, and Pete's gonna pull that out as it's already baked into the numbers we've simulated out of there. And for future years, that will change the escalation rate of healthcare costs going forward. In addition, by 2022, it's estimated that the healthcare costs would be shared in an 80-20 percentage for employees, which would save in fiscal for more than 25 years, and I'm a resident of the city as well. What inspires me to paint our savings in 2021 and would achieve a full one and a half million dollar savings going forward from fiscal year 2022 and on. So now this picture, what we're showing right now, you can see those blue bars exist above that 17% reserve mark over the next five years, which we would call a good picture, a sustainable picture for the general fund. However, there are some other things we need to consider. The 10 year outlook would be impacted by that last two years where you can see a cash flow deficit does still exist. Pete, if you can highlight, uh, go, go back to the five year mark, but highlight our cash flow deficit in fiscal year 23. You can see there, 22 to 23, that deficit would begin to grow again because the cost escalation rates are outpacing the revenues. One of the potential solutions we've discussed is the implementation of a stormwater fee to relieve the general fund of the burden of the cost of stormwater by a direct fee that all properties who benefit from the stormwater services would pay their fair share. That would generate approximately $1.66 million and grow over time as properties develop and the cost escalation rates for that would grow as well. This is an assumption it's gonna be a future decision, but is one of the pieces of this potential sustainability future. And Pete's gone ahead and add that $1.6 million in there. So save this to last. Now we're showing not only a sustainable five years, but a surplus going forward over the next five years, which would add to the reserve balances. However, as we're all well aware of in the state of Florida, there's an amendment in the 
elections coming up in November that would add to the homestead exemption for properties valued between $100,000 and $125,000. We've looked at the impact of that to your city particularly and have programmed in the impact into this model by not only uh, consulting with your property appraiser and their estimates of the impact, but also doing an independent analysis of all homesteaded properties as mm -hmm. exist currently in the city and what the impact would be to your city. So Pete's gonna turn on that toggle and calculate the model. And you can see by pulling out that homestead exemption, we now go back to a situation of cash flow deficits in the next few years that would deplete reserve balances. Many of our clients throughout the state are struggling with how they're going to accommodate this homestead exemption. Some who don't have non-avalor assessments, such as fire assessments, are considering adding a diversified revenue source. Many who have capped out their available revenues are considering fully offsetting it with a millage rate. We discussed with city management and we're going to program in a full offset of that homestead exemption by showing a 0.317 millage increase in 2020 that would completely offset the impacts of that homestead exemption. And once Pete calculates that, you can see now our blue bars are right back where we were with the green bars. So I want Pete to open this up to the 10 year model to show that while our five year outlook is now sustainable with all of these budget decisions and future decisions that need to be made, you can see in the end of the 10 year forecast, the cash flow deficit does reappear. So corrective action will need to be taken somewhere in the future and it could be mitigated by a small millage increase somewhere along the lines or cost savings. We programmed in a 0.15 millage adjustment in 2023 as a previous time we've shown this and it goes towards kind of the uh, a calibration in your mind of what sort of correction may be made or needed on the revenue side of things to keep a 10-year sustainable forecast with the cost escalation rates we now have in there. We want to focus back on the five-year program though, if you, Pete, you could pull it back, because really what's in front of you is this current year's budget decisions and we want you to start thinking about how those decisions impact the future sustainability of this fund. We are long range planning consultants and long range planning has everything to do, not to do with the future decisions, but with the future of your current decisions. So as you go into this budget cycle and you make your decisions in terms of the not to exceed millage rates and how this budget can be adopted and some of the changes that the city manager has recommended, we would like to at least opine that the future of this fund could very well be sustainable with some of these corrections and without some of the major decisions you've already undertaken in the past, the sustainability of this fund would be a lot worse as it, as it could be today. So we have confidence going forward in this fund if these decisions were to be implemented going forward and you have a good outlook at the five year uh, program. And um, with that, that's the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to address any questions or concerns you may have as it relates to the financial model right now before I turn back over to Catherine. Anybody have any questions? Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you all. At this point, um, as Dan Tech presented, thank you very much. Um, I will say uh, thank you very much to budget staff um, who has worked very closely with Stan Tech, um, and I appreciate that back and forth. Stan Tech's provided a lot of great insight to us um, as we're looking at other cities and uh, throughout the state of Florida, and really in the US, they've provided a lot of great insight for that, so I appreciate um, our collaboration on that. As they presented, uh, what we're looking at um, and focusing on is a more sustainable financial future, and we've documented um, what some of those recommendations are uh, to correct that structure to slow down uh, the cost growth. BCPA delivered the July 1st uh, numbers and the, the July 1st uh, total taxable assessed values. It slightly decreased from our June estimates. However, we were able to not increase any of the um, rates from June um, to July. That being said, I'm just gonna read through the business plan proposed highlights to maintain the current millage rate at 5.78232. The average single family household will pay an additional $31 in property taxes if the city maintains the current millage rate. Uh, this will allow the city to balance the budget without the use of reserves. 
And in doing so, I want to say that because we are still seeing cities having to balance their budget by use of reserves. The voter, debt, uh, the voter approved debt service proposed millage increase will slightly decrease. And the fire assessment fee will increase for single family home from 180 to 200, multifamily from 195 25 cents to 215, commercial from 23 to 26.1, and industrial warehouse from 2.98 to 3.62, and industrial from $27 to $31.87. Residential solid waste assessment will increase by $21. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And the water rates um, for that one improvement district that we are um, in charge of will increase by $2.32 per month for the average single family homeowner. And this was with the 3.5 uh, for the 2013 water uh, wastewater study that was um, done. New, initi new initiatives come in the form of capital adds to staff and operating where we are um, continuously adding new programs or adding to existing programs. And you'll see that in the form of the, uh, the projects up there and we'll also talk about them as it relates to each strategic goal area. But when we ask, when residents ask, oh, what will, this, uh, what will they see in the community? Well, what will businesses see? What will visitors see? So these are some of those items that they'll see in the community are new. When people ask, where does our money um, come from? Where does it go? Um, then this is how we receive the money into the city. Uh, the first of what, the first uh, item is the ad valorem. That's our largest percentage at 45%. Uh, the second are top eight revenues that we get for the state on revenue shares and things like that. That is 32% of the revenue that we get in. We'll talk about that, how that grows in a little bit. And we also have charges for services and user fees um, and the other category. But let's talk a little bit about the ad valorem. This is the total taxable assessed values. You can see we are still in a period of growth from 2008 when we are at $10.39 billion. At this point, we have not reached that, so I still consider ourselves in a period of, um, of, uh, of recovery, not growth. However, when we're looking at some of the taxable, the net new, that's the peaks, the red peaks at the top, you can see on what that looks like with the Broward County average and other cities. And you'll see that last year we had uh, 28 million and that did grow for this year for $84 million in net new. This is our millage rate and where um, the 2018 final millage rates for other um, like cities. Uh, we are looking at um, hearing from the other cities on what they are proposing and we'll have some of those numbers for uh, the budget hearings in September, but everybody is still talking with their um, councils and commissions on that. So what we are proposing is to keep the millage rate the same. Uh, what this will do, this will bring in $3.3 .3 million of revenue and state law requires a two-thirds vote to keep the millage rate the same. It will be advertised as a tax increase, even though we are not, even though you are not voting to increase millage. Um, to rollback rate would be cutting out 3.3 million, um, and the rollback rate is 5.5366. When we talked about uh, the second largest, where does your money come in from, the top eight revenues, you can kind of see what the, the very bottom, the smallest number, to be honest, on the page is what the growth is. So we look at what happened in 2017, it grew at 1.16%. And what we are seeing in 18 is 1.66. And we have a little bit of an uptick in what we are budgeting for 19 at 2%. So this is not a growth that is very, uh, does not keep up with our growth line on the, on the expenditure side. When we look at the grant summary that we get in, we get other monies by, uh, by grants that we come in. We have a grant coordinator that is responsible for this. And she works with many of the other departments as well um, who have grant um, writers in their departments as well. So we have um, explored $21 million worth of grants, applied for $7.8 million, and right now have uh, funded $1.1 million. I touched a little bit on the strategic planning model that we um, all gathered back in November, October, November, um, in January and February, and we looked at what our strategic priority areas are going to be. And these are the goal areas that uh, we all decided on. At this point, we have the initiatives per strategic goal area. 
I'm going to pause at this uh, at this point to if you have any questions, we'll go um, goal area by goal area, not project by project. Are there any questions on any of the projects on responsible city government? Yes, the um, grant consultant. So you, you already said that we have applied or are applying. So are we hiring another grant consultant or? What we'll be doing is we'll be designating money to a side to be able, we have a grant coordinator, and we have seen the benefit of um, having a specialist, uh, utilizing someone else outside the city, a consultant, to go for more specialized grant opportunities. The public art grant opportunity that we recently um, are exploring, we utilized um, someone that knows exactly how to write that grant application that has written a similar grant application, and we're wanting to do that in other areas. So in trying to um, reach out to more different op um, opportunities and options, that's where we'll be um, focusing that money toward, is by going out to specialized grant writers um, with that $10,000 in 2019. Learning? Yes, the city is um, looking at, and we've piloted this, and it's been very successful. You can go and with LinkedIn, I'm sure you have a LinkedIn account, same platform, and you're able to um, bring in a lot of other training on that platform that you can designate per employee, an employee group, and that actually happens within the LinkedIn tool. For citywide, um, coming in at only $23,000 for all employees. Training, okay. All right, I'm gonna move over to the next goal area, the city investment in today and future. Questions on this area? Moving right along to uh, downtown becoming vibrant and growing local economy. These are the areas that we are working on in those strategic goal areas. Development agreement for Cornerstone. I thought that was already done. It is being um, worked on and, and city staff is still going to be working on that going into next fiscal year. And the last area that um, I'll pause on just for a second is Premier Community in South Florida. Um, I'll specifically highlight the SRO area. And uh, three out of the five SROs are designated to add one SRO uh, for a total of the three high schools that we have, the Coral Springs High School, uh, JP Taravella, Coral Glades. Um, and it will bring the SRO count at each of those high schools to two. Uh, we looked at the model to say any school over 2,000, we will add um, an SRO. So those uh, those two, three high schools will be looked at having two SROs at each of those high schools. Um, in total, uh, I'll also say two of the five are also currently designated and we're having conversations with charter schools, um, Imagine and Renaissance to offer our program of SROs. So at this point we'll be um, having five SROs, if they do engage in that program, then we're looking at having 25 SROs in the city, um, putting 25 SROs in our city schools, in our public city schools. School board? We uh, currently receive $46,252 for each SRO. Uh, what the negotiations are right now is to bring that number up to 52,000 per SRO, and um, that is the current conversation right now. Okay. okay. All right, let's address some of the other funds. The fire fund <laughs> assessment. I We're proud of our, now. yes. Go, go back to that last slide. Happy to. You have to explain something to me. Uh, it, it, okay, adding radio authentication to all public safety radios. Yes. I'm gonna have to uh, phone a friend. Afraid I'm going to have to phone a friend. <laughs> uh, the the radio system is is not my my wheelhouse. Uh, so uh, my understanding of it, and I'll give you uh, you know my understanding of it, is that um, you know the authentication has to occur, and you know it's a, a fee that needs to be paid, and that's why it's added in there. Sorry. Does it have anything to do with um, our cooperation or collaboration with the county system? No, that it's separate and apart. Okay. It's all in house. It's all in house. Yeah. Thank you. Our fire assessment. 
Uh, we're proud of our fire department and we appreciate the excellent level of service that they provide. This chart illustrates the city comparison of the single family. Um, for us, single family um, and some of the others, it's residential assessment fee or assess, uh, assessment. Next, um, diving into what that uh, will provide and what the fire fund provides it for the proposed, we've already gone through the fire assessment rate increase. Um, just to also let everyone know, every five years we do have an independent rate, um, an independent fire assessment study done. Um, they let us know kind of the parameters of the fire assessment. Every year we do look and re review the call volume to make sure that we are appropriately charging the different um, structures um, for, um, for that. So every year we do look at that. We, we move out the, the outliers for smoothing effects. But at this point, we know kind of how much we need to be charging the single family, multifamily, and what the percentage difference should be. Uh, the adds to staff um, for this are three firefighter paramedics, one logistics captain, and converting a part-time to full-time for fire inspect uh, for the principal office assistant at the fire academy now that they can accept um, uh, state more, more state money. Uh, focus on firefighter safety, health and safety, and these are some of the capital requests that we have uh, that we'll be working on for the fire department. The residential solid waste assessment comparison. You'll see as follows. Some of the drivers to the increased rates are CPI increases per collection and disposal agreements. That is, um, that's gone up. Um, and the tonnage um, increase when the economy does well, then you receive more in waste. And so we are seeing that there's an increase in that cost. Uh, the recycling costs are increasing due to the material uh, market and that decline. Um, as well as the increase, um, as we're seeing in the contamination charges, so that area is going up. Um, household hazardous waste program, program um, that's also an increase in participation, somewhat uh, shared with the increasing, um, improving economy. And that's a little bit of a breakdown on how we got there. As I said, the water and sewer fund highlights this is a little bit more detailed. We're uh, recommending the 3.5 uh, weighted average adjustment. Um, this is as of the 2013 uh, water and wastewater rate study. And you'll see some of the projects um, continue the inflow and infiltration correction program. Uh, we're going to do a continuation and ongoing programs to replace the existing galvanized water pipes and cast iron water mains throughout the utility area and a continuation of raw uh, well water replacement program throughout the utility. We get the question, how much of our tax bill goes to the city? We always tell people the first um, place is the school board um, going at 34.6% and second goes to um, the city uh, followed very closely behind with the county. And what does that mean to the average single family homeowner with their assessed value at 260 if we look at how much the average single family home is in Coral Springs? It's um, 367,000, uh, but to the assessed value, this just goes to prove that how people and save our homes, how long they stay in their ho homes in the city, um, as well as some that they are taking advantage of the, the homestead exemptions. This is how much they are looking to pay this year. So you'll see what the proposed number is and how much that increases um, from 2018 to 2019. If you ask the question, if my house, if we just moved it to another city, what does it look like? Uh, this slide will show that um, what our ad valorem percentage is for other cities. Um, our geo uh, debt service, our fire assessment, um, there is Palm Beach, uh, city of Palm Beach, uh, Pompano Beach that does have an EMS assessment. Um, other cities have stormwater assessments on there as well as solid waste. You'll see the asterisks are cities that do have, are participating in nuisance abatement. Another way of looking at this is how does your city uh, work with um, what they give in their property taxes. So if you look at just kind of on average what the um, electricity bill might, might be per month and what they pay for their TV, um, there is your city uh, property tax on how much you would pay as well as your cell phone. So that kind of looks at it that way as well as if we just look at the general fund um, because that's where our property taxes go toward, you'll see how much it breaks down in, in for a dollar. 
At this point, I'd really again like to recognize the, the budget and strategy team. I'd like to recognize the department directors, deputy city manager, um, attorney, as well as our city manager, Mike Goodrum. There's been a lot of work that we've gone through, of course, a lot of work that you have done with us, and there's been a lot of great work, diligent work, um, some good times in that um, as we kind of get ourselves through to September where we're having our first public budget meeting. So at this point, are there any questions from you all? Big question. Um, absolutely. Okay, I just checked with um, our dispatch supervisor, and what what that is is a new security feature on the radios uh, that's going to enable a mutual aid talk group as well. Uh, so it's an authentication that that will be uh, an added feature to the radios. It's something, to my understanding, must be done. So uh, we're going to write item two, resolution 2018-27, which is a solid waste preliminary assessment at this time. Yeah, I, we're going to do number two. We'll do number two. Resolution. And, okay. and uh, uh, Vice Mayor, as you know, um, the, the items two, three, and four are going to set the hearings for public hearing. We had a public comment, and so these three items right now are not public hearings. You're just going to go ahead and take the items and vote on them, but you're setting the public hearing. So the, the, the first resolution here, it involves solid waste assessment that, uh, that, that, that Catherine Gibbons spoke about. So resolution 2018-27, to resolution of the City Commission of the City of Coral Springs, Florida, relating to the provisions of residential solid waste collection services and facilities and programs, solid waste collection services in the City of Coral Springs, Florida, providing for purpose and definitions, providing for legislative determinations, establishing the estimated rate for the solid waste collection services assessment for the calendar year beginning January 1st, 2019, directing the preparation of assessment role, authorizing a public hearing, and directing the provision of notice thereof, providing for an effective date, and the effective date of the public hearing will be September 12, 2018, 5.15 p.m., which you'll consider the final adoption of this assessment right here in chamber. So it's a request to go ahead and approve resolution 2018-27. Discussion on that? No. Motion. Yes, number two. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? No. All in favor. <clears throat> Aye. Mayor, are you still there? I'm still here. Aye. Thank you. Aye. Okay. It passed uh, unanimous. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Next item is going to be resolution 2018-28. Uh, resolution of the City Commission of the City of Coral Springs, Florida, relating to the provisions of fire services and facilities and programs in the city, providing for purpose and definitions, providing for legislative determinations, establishing the estimated rate for the fire service assessment for fiscal year beginning October 1st, 2018, directing the preparation of assessment role, authorizing a public hearing, and directing the provisions of notice thereof, providing for an effective date. And this is a request to approve this resolution. This resolution also accepts, um, sets that public hearing for Wednesday, September 12th, 2018 at 5.15 p.m. Uh, for final adoption, for your consideration for final adoption, and that's being done here in chambers. So it's a request to approve resolution 2018-28. Any discussion on that? Motion? Move to accept. Second. All approved? All Aye. in favor. Aye. 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 <laughs> Thanks, Mayor. <laughs> All opposed? Pass unanimous. Thank you, Vice Mayor. The next is, is the Truth and Millage Act that you're to consider commonly called the trim for our proposed fiscal year coming up 2018-19. Um, so it requests that the city takes several actions. First action is to establish the rollback operating millage rate at 5.5366 mills as required by state law. Establishing the proposed operating millage rate of 5.8732 mills, which is zero mills or zero percent more than the current rate of 5.8732. Establish the voter approved debt millage rate of 0.2652 dollars, which is 3.7 percent less than the current rate of 0.2753. Establish the, the required tentative budget public hearing on Wednesday, September 12, 2018 at 5.15 p.m. in City Commission Chambers right here. And establish the required final budget hearing on Thursday, September 20th at 6.30 p.m. in the City Commission Chambers. Also to authorize appropriate legal ads to be advertised 
on or about September 2nd, 2018 and September 17, 2018 to address the final budget hearing on Thursday, September 20, 2018 at 6.30 p.m. It's a request to uh, approve all those items. I'll remind the commission that the trim that's being asked to, to be set, the proposed operating millage rate of 5.8732, once it's set, can very easily go down, but it's almost impossible to, to, to go higher. So having said that, uh, request to approve those actions. Any discussion on that? I'll move it. Second. Move the second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Approve your mandate. Aye. Understanding that, that I'm not going to vote for it to go up. Right. Good. Oh. Agreed. Okay. We got it. Anyway, yeah, so it's been approved. Okay. Pass unanimous. Yep. Okay. Uh, number five, the business plan. Catherine. Um, item five, are, are you doing the, the request? It's a request to adopt the fiscal year. You've already presented it, so mm -hmm. it's just simply a request to adopt. Okay. To adopt. Second. Move to second it. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Mayor. Pass unanimous. Public art program. Discussion on that? Yeah, Susan? I believe Ms. Chrisman is coming up. Yep. While we're, while we're waiting for Susan, the, the comment that I wanted to make before we approved the current proposed millage rate is I don't think any of us like, you know, increasing cost. But as Stanpac has pointed out, we would be facing a deficit in the future. And the part of this is for planning for the future. We also have a major concern with the state passing the additional $25,000 homestead exemption that's going to put another $3.2 million dent in our budget. And you can see where we've reduced costs for health care and salaries and things like that, but it's still going to be difficult to run this business. Mayor, Vice Mayor. Yeah. Very good. Well, the mayor, will, the mayor will say that we have an obligation as elected officials to provide fiscal sustainability. And I think this is the only way we can have fiscal sustainability. And I don't want to raise any more than we have to, and I will assure you that I will vote against anything that I think is a penny more than we have to. Great. Okay. Susan? Okay. Good evening. Uh, we are here tonight to talk about the public art program and get your uh, report to you about how it's been going and the direction, any direction that you would like to give us. Before we begin, I wanted to just briefly touch again with all of you about the Bloomberg grant because it is becoming a large part of our program and activity for the next couple of years if we should get it, if we should be so lucky to get it. So uh, just wanted to make sure that uh, you understand that we are one of 14 proposals that are uh, shortlisted and that we will find out in the fall about whether or not we get it. Between that time and now, we need to provide a full submittal that uh, requires quite a bit more work between now and August 16th. And we are using that public art consultant that uh, you just heard Catherine say to help us do that. And in this, uh, in this effort, we are looking also to uh, have partners with us throughout this entire thing. And they are listed in the grant on those that would participate and, and have given us letters of support, which are the City of Parkland, Broward County Cultural Division, Broward Health, and of course, the Coral Springs Museum of Art. Uh, it does require $50,000 of, of, of money that would come from the public art fund, and we hope that we could get your support. You would be approving that through the budget this year because the public art fund is part of the budget that you approve as well. So I've given the dates of August 16th as the full proposal, proposal that's due, but also if we're lucky to get shortlisted further, we would have Skype or a site visit between September 4th and 21st. They come down and actually check it out or Skype with you as well. <coughs> Uh, about and then the winners are announced in the fall. So it, we do have two years to complete that effort and uh, the money would be going $25,000 each year from the matching grant from the public art fund that we would help up to a million dollars to do the five projects that we're hoping to do. So are there any questions about the Bloomberg grant? Just want to make sure you understood what the timeline is. So not to take too much time about the history, but we're really actually glad to be here in front of you. It's been a long time since we've talked about the public art program, and there's a lot of activity that's been going on. We really have quite a few things that have happened over the last 15 years that it's been in, uh, in existence. And it started with the Chapter 6 of the Code, which lays out 
the basics of what we needed to set up a code for it that deals with including the definitions and the, how, you, how you calculate the fees, the uh, duties of the pl public art committee, and to mention there's a couple public art committee members over here, Kathleen and Joyce, I see in, in the audience here. Thanks for coming. And up here, Candy up here too. I didn't see you before. So um, anyway, we have the, that's laid out, and in that, the references uh, to the uh, actual five-year master plan as well as the guidelines for the for the program so they're separate and apart from the actual ordinance and we've amended the ordinance two times since it began once was for to increase the number you might remember this Larry from five to seven members and then the other time we did was to allow the Commission to have more flexibility in selecting an artist if it wasn't an artist that met uh, the standard criteria that we have so Anyway, updating you next on that, we, we of course always advertise the most about that it's not, done, nothing is purchased with the ad valorem taxes that's done through the, the impact fee that the developer pays. The program, as I mentioned, is for 15 years worth. It's 26 permanent art, artworks have been purchased. Five on-site privately owned ones have been done. We've started to do the signal box wraps as well. And one has been uh, donated. Uh, the sculpture on sample and art walk sculptures ex exhibitions have held, been held several times. So since 2003, we've actually collected $1.6 million, and we've actually expended a million dollars. So that's not just chump money at all. So it's 15 years worth of a serious uh, fund that we've done a lot of good things with. We've incorporated the goals that you currently have um, that you've done in your strategic plan so that you can see that what those are there <coughs> into the program. And it uh, typically takes, they say, about 20 years to reach your uh, p potential of really making an impact. And here we are at 15 <coughs> years. So it's a good time to be looking at this and making sure our next five-year program uh, is well thought out and encourages the, all the things that we wanted to do, which is really to um, keep the quality of life and, and as economic development aspect of it as well. So from here, Jim Hickey will go ahead and walk you through a little bit more of the detailed information of how the public, uh, how the program works, and he can highlight some of the artworks as well. Get all the good graphics with that. <laughs> I get to do all the pretty, pretty pictures, but she got a couple in the front end, so um, I just wanted to walk through. The other person, thank you, um, Ms. Christman introduced the Public Art Committee, but also I want to just introduce uh, Laura Atria, who's our public art consultant. She's been with us for several years now. Um, when she's not here, she's actually also an artist. So she's been very helpful with us to, uh, she speaks the artist language sometimes and it's difficult. Some artists are better than others with the business side of things. So she's been really helpful in trying to coordinate and um, make, the, make the program successful. I just wanted to walk through the selection process a little bit. It, there are a few steps that we take. Um, we do, we do base everything that we do on that master plan. We develop projects and then we do a call for artists. That's actually approved by the Public Art Committee. Um, Lorelei and staff review it and then we place it on this website called CAFE. The only reason I mention this is we've done very well in the past few years with going through this process. It's a, a nationally recognized system. Um, it goes out to really national, international artists to actually go through this and submit. And I'll talk about a couple pieces and I'll mention that we actually got these artists to, through Cafe. cafe. Um, we actually go through shortlist the, the number of artists. We have another public art meeting. We narrow those down to usually uh, three or four. And then we have them, we go back to them and have them provide us more detailed information. Um, and then if there's anything, if the art piece is under $20,000, the uh, Chapter 6 of the Public Art, art Ordinance allows the Public Art Committee to vote for that. If it's anything more than that, it comes back to you all for review and approval. So the com um, if it was over the $20,000, we would have the Public Art Committee make that recommendation, and then we bring that to you for your consideration. This is uh, very small, but it will tell you the existing public art, and all I really wanted to do is show you that is Based on what we have in the city, we've actually have art pieces almost throughout the city. The last few years, and we'll talk about that, we focused in on downtown, but there's really been an effort to look at the master plan and try to, to place art in the areas where the master plan is telling us um, locations to be. And this slide is really just showing you, I just wanted to give folks a um, 
cross-section of the types of art that we do. It's not just um, bronze, it's not just mosaics. We actually ch have tried to provide a varied type of um, art in the city. And I know um, you all get calls, I get calls quite often that some people like certain pieces and some people don't. Um, but this is an effort to kind of expand and, and really it's, a, it's for conversation. Um, and a lot of folks, you know, sometimes have issues and they'll call me and they say, my son or daughter has, has a concern with this. But, you know, the best part is that they're having that conversation and they're talking about public art and they're kind of uh, enriching, enriching their children's lives by kind of having that discussion with them and explaining to them the importance of the public art and the program. Yeah. Yes. The most questions I get on public art is the is the one, one in the on middle. Corner, University Drive and Riverside Drive. And the <laughs> same question. What the heck is What it? is it? One of my favorites. And it, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's called Women of the Future, but it's up to interpretation. And we've had all exactly. sorts of, I get the most calls on that as well. Although, knock on wood, or for Micah, I haven't had many calls in the last few years. Um, They're used to it now. I think, I think people do get used to it. And, you know, I, I've had a few conversations where you know, a parent was concerned about it and, you know, I said, well, this is the conversation that you have with them to kind of explain to them that art is subjective and, you know, different people see different things in the, in the art piece. So I'll leave it at that for, for that discussion. But also there's bronze, we've done steel. Um, Lars Ego, which is on the left, the horse, she's, that's on Sample Road, that's very well um, received. I, I've seen pictures of children being placed on top of it and taking a photo. Um, and also, um, HD or Humpty Dumpty, as everyone calls it, this was probably one of our first pieces that we bought that really people loved and people would stop and take photographs of. So he was relocated to the Art Walk. We did get a call the day we moved him that he disappeared because he used to be on Sample Road. Um, but he is down in the Art Walk and um, it just adds a little bit. And I think with Beyond, which is the triangular piece, and now with Ascent uh, by Jen Lewin, we're having that more interactive and people are, you know, every time I go by, I see someone kind of interacting with that, with that art, and that's, that's really great to see. Um, Jen Lewin, by the way, for Ascent, she's a nationally recognized artist. We got her through the CAFE program. Um, she does installations throughout the world, so, and she was excellent, excellent to work with. As part of the program, and I'll go a little, little bit into it further, um, you, can, you can actually um, pay into the public art fund if you're doing development or you can actually do on-site artworks. And these are just two, two examples of artworks. The, the, top, the top two are actually from the reserve. That's right on Sample Road here, just east of us. And the other is um, Gyro by Claudia Jane Klein that was out in the corporate park. And that was JBI that, that did an installation there and, and did a really good job. It's a beautiful piece if you're out there and it's industrial and it kind of matches with, the, with the, uh, the development that's there. And again, in um, for 2014 and 2018, we had, we had heard from uh, members of the commission that, you know, let's take some of this and focus it back on downtown and, and start putting more pieces in downtown. And that was also when we started thinking about the Art Walk. The Art Walk got installed. There's six piece, there are six locations for art on the Art Walk, so we started um, putting art pieces out there. So right now, Union One, Ascent, and Beyond are on the Art Walk, and then, of course, our um, our wrap there that sat the corner of um, Coral Hills and Sample, and that really, you know, directs folks up to the covered bridge, which is just north of the location. But we did hear you all, and we are trying to focus more on the on the downtown pieces. And again, just some more purchases. Um, on the left is Celestial. That's right in our building now. This was the first uh, piece that we did internally. Um, this was uh, Ray King, another. Um, world-renowned artist, he does installations throughout the world. Um, and he was, again, through the CAFE program. We've, we've, we've seen the caliber of the type of artwork that we're getting in as far as submissions definitely increase with this, with this use of this new program. Uh, the other two pieces were part of our Sculpture on Sample and Art Walk program this year. Um, the Heart and also Noise, those were both purchased. Um, noise is actually now located at the Center for the Arts in front of the building. Um, folks are really liking it in that location. Uh, low Poly Heart, we haven't really figured out a location. We're going to work through the next fiscal year and find a good location for him. Um, he's right in front of, he's right on Sample Road in front of Cook and the Cork. And they love, they love it there, so, we, but we're going to have to find a permanent location for it at some point. But it could stay there for a little while until we, we find the best location. 
So we talked a little bit about this, and of course, I, I can't go through a public art presentation without saying no ad valorem tax dollars are used to purchase public art. And that's something really that we, I try to educate folks that are calling and you know, that's the first thing someone says, well, you're using all these, ta you're using the tax dollars and you know, you could have policemen, you could have firemen, but you're, you're putting public art in place. It's a separate um, account that goes in and it's for um, either development or redevelopment. So if someone was to come in and build a new Costco, for example, Costco would pay a, a uh, public art fee. Uh, in addition, we've had a couple public supermarkets that have done renovations. When they do renovations, they would pay the, re the development or the, the remodeling or converting fee. So any property over 12,500 square feet of commercial or industrial, non-residential, pays into the fee. Any multifamily over an acre would pay into the fee as well. So your option is, first is the impact fee, and that's what kind of a pay and go, you just pay, pay the fee into the public art fund, it goes into the public art fund, and then the committee itself determines where those locations of art would be and how to utilize those dollars. Uh, the second is the on-site. Now that is a little bit more expensive than the, the main public art fee. One of the main reasons we did that was because it does take more funds to actually do the installation. You know, when we do the public art fund, we're taking it and we're putting a piece of art in. We, you also have to do your base. If you're doing lighting, if you're doing all of that site work, that site work is included in that on-site fee. So that's why it's a little bit higher. And also we wanted to, um, in a way to incentivize them paying the impact fee so that we would have funds to use throughout the city as well. And Ms. Christman touched on this. I just wanted to give you another um, snapshot of this. This is the amount of money we've collected in both the general fund and the escrow fund, which is the, which is the on-site artwork. Right now, the current balance is $160,000. A portion of that is actually was paid, or actually the majority of that was paid through one charter. So when one charter came in, they used they were going to do on-site artwork, and that's one of the dis one of the discussions we have to have both with the public art committee and, and the commission as a whole. Is that money sitting in there? Now it's a new owner. Um, that money will stay in that place until we determine um, the best use of those funds. Um, staff is recommending that we would just transfer those back into the main um, public art fund, and we can utilize those funds for an art piece that we do in the downtown area. That's at least the recommendation that we were going forward to. Um, but you can see, and there has been some expenditures and we've been um, trying to expend the funds. What we really focus on is trying to budget next year based on the amount of funds that we create, that we have coming in for, the, for this year. Um, there were some lean years, of course, when we knew the development wasn't coming in and we were very careful about overspending in those years. We tried to spend only the money that we were, that we were receiving in from development. Um, that's picking up now, but, but again, you have to make sure that there's sufficient funds in there to, to do the budgeted items that we're, that we're proposing. One of the things uh, in the Public Art Committee we've been talking the last couple months really about is kind of the, the overall vision and the master plan. Um, one of the things we've been hearing from, from folks is a focus on, on downtown redevelopment and the art walk, but also there's been a discussion about rather than having these smaller pieces that we do through Sculpture on Sample, start to look at really large pieces that we can do, entry, feature, entry features that we can do at all the entries at coming into the city, um, some of our large parks, some of those, and really have, have some large pieces that we could install throughout the city based on the master plan, of course, that we have. And that's talking, and that's, that's there. And really, um, and I think Commissioner Daly is, is not here this evening, but also, you know, there is an economic value to that. There is, there is a reason people want to come and see those pieces. Um, for example, in Amsterdam, there's a, that the I am Amsterdam sign, there's thousands of people that are there. They go, they stand on it, they climb on it, they do all of those things, but then they, they'll stop, they'll have a cup of coffee, or they'll, they'll do something else in that area. So it does bring people into the community and just finding ways to, to better publicize that and, and get folks into Coral Springs and realize that we have a fairly robust program. We're one of the leaders in South Florida for, for public art. Mayor, I have a question. Um, and again, one of the other things with, uh, we had Ray King's piece is really to incorporate art into the development. When we start looking at downtown and parking garages, 
uh, facades, all of these things we can start to look at as ways of bringing the public art into the, the building or structure itself and trying to find different ways. It doesn't always have to be a piece of art or a fountain. It could be part of a building that, that the artist works with the, with the builder. Um, and then just really promotion and education about the program. I think we need to be cognizant of that and keep pushing out the, the information to the public so they understand that it's not ad valorem tax dollars and that, we're, that we have a master plan that we're following. So this is very small, but I think that's on your, uh, this is the future uh, master plan. So this would be locations of where um, future pieces would be located. And it hasn't changed much over time. And again, we're looking at the entry features, large park areas, and really a focus in on downtown. <coughs> and this is very large, but this just basically sums up the, the overall proposed budget for the next five years. Um, the, the larger ones would be for ent entryway sculptures. The thought is to do three or four of those in the <coughs> next five years. Um, the other is uh, downtown permanent sculpture. If development does um, start moving, as we have got a few developers in, we'd look to do another piece, maybe in one of those locations. Um, either they're gonna, they, if they do an on-site, that would be great. <coughs> if, if not, we could work with them and, and do a piece um, in our new downtown. Um, maintenance, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Maintenance has been um, increasing over time. So we have had maintenance uh, ongoing, and just as an example, for the last, from fiscal year 03 to 12, we expended just over almost $18,000. The past few years, though, however, you can see we've spent 40, almost $41,000. And that comes with pieces of art that we have for 15 years. Um, both <coughs> Rotate and Union One have actually, well, U Union One has been um, taken out for maintenance once that is going back out because it, it needs some major repairs, so we'll be working on that. Uh, Rotate actually has been repaired twice. The second time we actually took it away, sanded it down to the metal, repowder coated, and put him back out there. He's out at the Aquatic Center now and uh, doing very well, but over time, um, as the public art ages and, and things change, we have to make sure we do an annual inspection of the art but we want to make sure that those pieces are maintained and we can get the fixes to them before um, structural or, or other things happen to it. Uh, there is a, in the public art guidelines, there is a way to actually decommission pieces if we determine that they're, um, where if we're spending more on maintenance than the piece is actually worth. Then we would work with the, and go through the process and we may get to a point in another 10 or 15 years where that might be the case where we want to remove pieces because they're not, um, they're not doing well in the South Florida climate. And we've learned that over time that we really have to let the artists know if they're not local to understand the heat and the amount of rain that we get, especially with metal pieces that, that rust and other, and, other, uh, and other pieces that we use, so. Yeah, we even had to repair the horse. The horse has been repaired, yes. Actually, the horse has been repaired a couple times. His, his hooves had to be changed out because there was water that was collecting and it was rusting those pieces. So we actually had to put, uh, I guess, horseshoes on the bottom, for lack of a better term, plastic horseshoes that would raise the, raise the piece up. But it's ongoing and it's, and it's gonna be a um, larger portion of the budget as we move forward. But that happens when we have um, 26 pieces of art. So the maintenance too, and just if I didn't explain it to you, the on-site, um, the folks that do the, their on-site, their own art, they actually maintain the pieces that are on their facility. We maintain the pieces that we have purchased through the public art fund. So the on-site artwork is the, is the responsibility of the, of the property owner. So again, just to come back around, uh, really the focus would be for larger pieces, focus on the downtown, focus on entryways, um, and continue to bring in different pieces of artwork. Um, and I think really the, the success of those interactive pieces, if we can do those, in, especially in pedestrian locations or even if we determine uh, park locations, you know, really to get that interactive, to get people interested in the piece, people take pictures, they post them on social media, and then you know, it's, it definitely is PR for the, for the city and for the program as well. That piece that I posted, the one that moves in and yes. out? 
If they come in smaller versions, yep. we could get something. We could look, and we actually reached out to that artist. Um, you're talking about there's a there's a um, artist that does kinetic sculptures, that that oh, the breeze changes and almost like a almost like a windmill type of thing, but more more of an artistic look. Um, of course, that's not always work works well with the building code, so we'd have to work with him. I think I think it's an interesting discussion to have with him, and we have reached out to him, um, it, but. When I posted it, I couldn't believe the yeah. interaction that came with it. Definitely, definitely, he's on the list. And again, that's one of the things I know that um, some of you and and it's funny when you go travel and you see other cities, you see things. So definitely, if you all see pieces of art that you like, or you see an artist that you like, or even kind of a concept or an idea, like please let let myself know, or and we can talk with the public art committee, and they're looking for input as well. Um, we're really trying to to bring uh, varied pieces of artwork to the city. And if you see a good artist that's, that has really quality art, um, that's, those are the folks we wanna get on our list to make sure that we're reaching out to them. So, This is our um, public art annual plan. I won't touch on this too much, but this is our budget for next year. This goes in with the city's budget every year. So we try to allocate that out to um, Really, to do the artwork sculpture, that's $100,000. And the other big ticket item would be the Bloomberg grant. Um, and maintenance, right now, we have it at 15, although in future years, we'll probably increase that as, as more pieces come into, the, come into the program. So the total budget for that is 227. We expect to have um, that much funding into the public art fund by the end of the fiscal year. We've had some large developments, Costco and others come in, so yes. Jim, I want to make a... Uh comment on the uh the traffic box wraps yes they are great <laughs> they are great uh in fact i requested that maybe some of these favorite. boxes in the future would be uh, uh kind of more patriotic okay good idea uh, yeah and i th well i i think there's another commissioner that uh <laughs> <No point. gasps> yep would you <laughs> can i speak sure <laughs> so the the traffic um box wraps i Palm Beach County probably six or seven years ago and took photos of them and kept bringing it back to staff or whatever. Um, I believe this commission approved them to be in the downtown area. Um, somehow, some way, they've gone ahead throughout the city, um, which isn't necessarily the, the biggest problem in the world. We were gonna test it out, whatever, but I do have some concern with some of the choices. I personally think that some of them take away, actually, um, from the community. And, and you know, I drive around South Florida every day for work and I see what some of the other communities are doing, and honestly, I think they're doing a better job and really hitting the mark more. And I think, um, as the commission, we need to, like, you know, um, the vice mayor said he likes to see stuff more patriotic, whatever. I think we need to give better direction um, to Jim and, and to the committee to show exactly more what we're looking for. Um, you know, and I, I personally would like to see those come in front of the commission before purchases are made. Um, because I think that makes a difference. Um, you know, maybe you know, if there's an opportunity for people to come out and see them and, and what they're gonna look like ahead of time and to get the public to come and speak on them, it might be a, a better choice. So. Mr. Vice Mayor. Possibly. Mr. Vice Mayor. Hello. Hmm? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'd like to make a comment about that. So we have a public art committee that has professionals on it, people that understand, or I don't, I still draw stick figures and, and I'm the liaison for that committee but they are very professional. Candy, for one, is an artist herself. And, and like you said, the art is subjective. You know, I see some in other cities that I think is awful, and I like the majority of what we have here. But us approving it over the designated public art group, and there's a lot of them in there, and they're all artists. There's two more right here. And they, they just, I think they have a better understanding of it than I, and it's so subjective. I, I understand, and, and I still think they should make recommendations. I think we should go ahead and make recommendations to them, the type of stuff we'd like to see. Uh, um, that's not, they can make their recommendations and come in front of us like every other committee does with any other purchases or anything. Um, but I know this commission went ahead and gave approval to do some of these in downtown, and they started sprouting around the community. And, and honestly, I've gotten complaints about one in particular that I'm not a fan of myself either. Um, but I think we need to give better direction to, to staff and, and to the committee as to what we're really looking for. But I think all those boxes really should come in front of us because like one of them honestly if went by my house, I'd be really upset. 
Um, I'm, I'm that much not a fan of it. Um, and I think some of them, you know, in Hanton, and then the one right across the street over here on Coral Hills Drive, I think is beautiful, and I think right. it fits the area, and it's a perfect fit. I think some of them um, take away from the area. I think some of them, you know, uh, you know, hurt the area and hurt some of the values over there. So I think, you know, seeing it there and, and – you know, people don't elect that committee. People elect us to go ahead and, and make decisions, and that's something that's going to be on that corner for a long time. My guess is they're meant to last a few years, right? They're meant to last a few years, but they're also replaceable. They're easily, you know, you can take the film off and put, put something new on. So if it's something that you all decide that you don't want to have on there, we could, we could switch it out. Um, I think the focus in the next couple years or the next year, if we do more, um, we're going to focus in on downtown because that was what we originally had, had done. Um, one of the main issues with putting pieces downtown is half of the intersection is owned by DOT, and DOT isn't as friendly as the county when it comes to wrapping their, their traffic boxes. So we'd have to work with them and make sure, and that, that's an agreement that will take a little bit longer to, to get approved. But I hear you, and, and I hear the commissioner as far as the types of items we did. We did have discussions about that and we tried to, and the, commi the committee was very cognizant that we didn't want anything that was too outlandish. We tried to do um, art pieces and pictures and photographs and things like that. And the, the one in question is a little bit more abstract than the others, but it still is based on a, on a photograph. So that was really what we were trying to do. So I, could, I can guarantee you this, no matter what we choose. No, I, somebody's not going to like it. But I, but I'm. Yeah, but there are, are are pieces that are a little bit more universally accepted. Um, I think, like you see at the parks when they did the the bronze statue, I think that's something that you know is more universally accepted. Humpty Dumpty, obviously one of the most popular art pieces right. in the city. Um, then there's ones like the one on on University that was mentioned earlier that maybe not as many people like. Um, but I think people elect us to go ahead and. and you know, make some decisions on stuff, and, and they don't know the committee members, and the committee can mean well, maybe we see something different or vice versa, but I think we should give direction, better direction what we're looking for, like you were saying, Mr. Vice Mayor, um, but I also think it should come back to us once they go ahead and they make their recommendations. And, and maybe what we could do, I'm just suggesting for, for the commission, is to bring to work with the liaison, Commissioner Carter, right now, if we know that there's something coming up, that we could have the meeting, we could bring it you know, to the next commission meeting and um, you could present it and I could talk a little bit about the piece and get some input or unless you want to do a one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, if we're going to get to the point of every piece of public art having a commission discussion on, I, don't, I, I, I wouldn't recommend that. I think that no, we need, no. um, but if that is the majority of the commission, please, you know, educate me on that at this point because, you know, that we would need to change some of our processes, but um, that would be, and plus this item is up for discussion, so if there's substantive ideas of where we're not hitting the mark, we'd like to hear it tonight so that we can hit the mark. Um, so if we could have that discussion. Personally, I have the confidence. All right, here's the mayor. If I could pipe in, Vice Mayor. Yes, please. You know, art is in the eye of the beholder. The reason why we have an art committee is we have individuals who we have trust in that are art people that understand it. And for a commissioner to say, I don't like this, and therefore we're not going to have it, I don't think is right. And I think that, that we have to understand that this art, by the way, am I, I'm hearing rebound. Am I rebounding there? No. No. Okay. Uh, art is very important, you know. For instance, I do not like Picasso, but yet his pieces will sell for $50 million uh, because there's people out there that like Picasso. But I don't think that we individually, because we're elected as commissioners, we have no art experience, should have somehow uh, either stop art or to favor art, whether it's commission or, or the vice mayor's intent to try to get more patriotic, you know, we, we got to look at the whole picture, and that's why we have a committee, and that's what I think we have to understand. We should accept or reject the recommendations of the committee, but I think they're the ones with more expertise than we have. Thanks, man. Yeah. Just, just make clear, I, I didn't think um, 
one commissioner, I know the mayor said eight commissioner, they don't like whatever, a majority of the commission would approve it. And, and I believe up until about four or five years ago, the commission would always approve every piece of public artwork, um, just based off the dollar amount that we used to spend on the pieces and the requirement that this commission have. And I think every public artwork up until about four years ago, maybe five, came in front of the commission. And it is what it is, and we get comments one way or the other. Um, but it would be a majority. It wouldn't be with one commission and like it, whatever, just like every other thing. You know, when we talk about no experience in art, like the mayor was saying, well, I don't have any experience in police work, in, in working for a fire department, and working in a lot of different departments that the city provides. But we're entrusted to go ahead and make decisions that obviously affect those, those different areas. So I'd like to see them come back in front of the commission. I mean, look, they could be done at a workshop. It doesn't mean it has to be a, a specific vote. It could be at the end of the workshop. We know kind of in advance when we're looking at these things and saying, okay, you know, how do you guys feel? We could take a, a simple, um, you know, see where people are at. If there's someone that's really against it or whatever, then we can go ahead and put it on a commission agenda and vote on it because we can't vote at a workshop. But I think there's, I think there's certain things that, you know, if, if I mean, honestly, the one on sample in Core Ridge by the McDonald's over there, I, I think it hurts property values in the area. I do. I think coming into the city when you see that, I think it's ugly. I get complaints all the time about it. And, way, and the thing I used to get the most complaints about was the one in University Drive. But that one box is ridiculous, and I'd be pretty upset if that went in by my house, honestly. I, I live not too far from a traffic intersection, and, and that would be upsetting to me to have that and look at that all the time. I think um, that was not the intent of what we were looking for when we started talking about doing the traffic boxes. I think more like the one on Sample on Coral Hills Drive when we go back to the original discussion, that's really what we were looking for. If you look at some of the cities like Boca Raton, what they've done, that's more what we were looking for. And again, I think that's on us to go ahead and give them direction on that. And honestly, I did not know this was gonna be uh, priority tonight. I didn't know this was going to be on our agenda tonight. Um, and, and you know, I, I met with the, the city manager earlier today and it wasn't brought up this was going to be on the agenda. So I'd like to see us go ahead and, and maybe as a commission go ahead and, and come up with ideas and things we'd like to see for public art. I know Mr. Hickey knows that I have, and you guys know, I've showed it to you at other workshops, different photos of things I've seen in other communities across the country. Um, and maybe give us some time and, and each of us go ahead and, and hand in some things and maybe workshop this later on on direction we like to see. But I'm not honestly prepared to go ahead and, and give direction as to where I want to see, whether it be patriotic or this or that or whatever. Um, I don't have my, my stuff with me right now to do that. But I think that's something that we should do and, and give a, a clearer idea of where that needs to go. But honestly, I, I think it was a little disheartening when we talked about doing this in the downtown area and we started seeing these pop up all around the city when the commission never gave approval for that. Um, and and I, I don't think there's, we would allow a lot of our committees to go ahead and make those decisions on their own, so. And, ju but, and just for clarification. Mayor, if, that, if I could, I think the, the box that Commissioner Vignola is speaking about, it's a great example, because that's my favorite one in the city. <laughs> it, it, it is, and so, um, um, and I've also heard from just as many people that, that love that one, but, um, but that, that's, that's part of, it, you know, I think high level we're going to need to identify, do we want art that is going to be the safest to where everybody's just comfortable with it? Or do we want to have some art that, that causes dialogue and that makes people think? And, uh, and that's probably, you know, high level. We need to have some of those conversations. But just, you know, moving forward, and uh, I'm moving forward under the, under the understanding that obviously anything that is 40,000 that's that's 20. not within my authority we would right. be bringing to the to the commission but if it's within my authority to spend that you know unless i kind of hear a direction from the commission to bring all those we're going to kind of proceed with how we have been doing that right currently yeah. in chapter six of land development code it requires 20? any yeah. twenty thousand. yes Thank it, so it's any piece section of section 604 20. talks about their powers and duties and anything under 20 right. they have the authority anything over they come to you currently so you the purchasing is is oh. is 40 right now and actually we had that discussion i think a year or so ago in a workshop and there was there was a unanimous uh discussion by the commission to keep that at the twenty thousand because anything larger than that's a larger piece and and you all wanted to have the review of that, so. Could I, could I, Mike, uh, Commissioner Vignola just said four or five years ago, the commission actually uh, approved all of the art. I'd like to have some history on that since I was not there four or five years ago as to why the commission uh, then changed it to the 20,000 under. And if you could give us some history on that, I would appreciate that. Sure, certainly, Mayor. Actually, the um, the twenty thousand dollar requirement has been in place since the inception of the program. 
So in 2003, it was set in section 604 that a maximum of, if it's over $20,000, it needs to come to the commission for approval. I think what's happened over the past few years is that there's been most pieces that we do are meet that criterion over $20,000, especially if we're doing um, a call to artists and someone's doing a commission piece, those are between seventy-five dollars and $100,000 and that definitely has to come to you all and it goes through that process. Um, the item that the Commissioner Vignola is talking about was very, it's very inexpensive to do. So it's, it's short money. Um, we work with an artist, we work with a, a vinyl company that comes and, and, and wraps them. Um, and you see those across the, across the, the county now and um, they're very popular elsewhere. There's even programs where, where you have an artist come out and actually paint them. Um, I've done programs like that in, in other, other locations. So, you know, that, that is the reason why it didn't come to you all because it was the un, under, the, under the threshold to do, so. So it's been there since the beginning of the program? Yes. Okay, yes, well that, that answers my question. I guess, is there anything else we want to? Mayor, yeah. Yeah, and, and Mr. Mayor, that, that's kind of the thing is before we always buy larger, more expensive pieces, this is something that, you know, we gave approval for the downtown area and because they were under that threshold, the first time we bought pieces really under that threshold that I can remember, um, that's why they were going up the way they are. It wouldn't be doing things any differently with this than we would any of the other larger pieces. Um, and that's was kind of my ask is to go ahead and treat them like the other larger pieces where the commission goes ahead and gets an opportunity to allow the public to come out and speak on them. And then the commission were to go ahead and, and make a decision based off the recommendations by the committee, which I honestly, I, I don't remember a time um, where the entire commission went against things, but it allows the public to come out and speak on them. And that way, um, if people have a complaint, they had an opportunity to come out and speak and their elected officials uh, were able to speak on their behalf also. That's something I think, think Mr. Vignola, we should definitely bring up so we should discuss it uh, and I'm thinking about stuff that I don't even want to put on the record tonight that people might be totally opposed to and yet the committee might be agreeable to. So I think it's something we should be de definitely talking about, but I don't think we should be now changing the policy. That's my personal opinion. I support that. So I guess we're going to workshop this then? You put that, Mike, put that on a workshop or we'll discuss sure. it? Sure. Okay. Any, any other discussions tonight? With that, I guess we're adjourned. Correct. No further items. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Mayor. Oh, wow. By nine, he had this quote.